Hello everyone, hello Kabayan. Welcome to the second quarterly event of our 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines celebration. Before we begin, we would like to introduce ourselves. I am Anton Brosas and this is my wife, Jennifer, our daughter, Avila Rose, and our son, Xavier James. I come from a family of four. My parents' families are from Cavite and Tarlac, but grew up in Manila and my parents are from Davao and Laguna. They were the people to bring me to the Catholic Church despite the challenges of practicing their faith when they both worked in Saudi Arabia. Although I was just two years old when I moved to Vancouver and had no recollection or comprehension of the difficulties they faced during their time abroad, my parents would often share stories with my sister and I about how they would listen to old recordings of the mass in private and hold Bible studies under the guise of a birthday party just to keep the faith alive. When my parents had me baptized into the church in a tiny underground hallway with a plain clothed priest, they risked their lives for me and ultimately for our faith. For me, my parents continued their faith when they moved to Canada in the late 70s. I remember going to church on weeknights or Saturday mornings because of the various ministries they were involved with. Without me knowing it, my faith in Jesus grew through those small experiences. Before we continue on with our celebration, we have some reminders for tonight. You can send your reaction and messages in the YouTube chat box. If you have questions for the donations or want to volunteer for future events, please email filipinoministry at rcav.org. It's not too late to invite your friends and family to celebrate with us. Use the hashtag, hashtag 500YOCVancouver, and hashtag Salamat to Vancouver. Now to start this event, let us begin with an opening prayer by Psalm 98. Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us together to celebrate 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines. This is a beautiful occasion for Filipinos around the globe to celebrate our Christian Catholic faith, to demonstrate our love for the Church as we walk together in the service of God. We ask you to guide us to be united in faith and action, to work in solidarity with one another, and the promotion of your word through continued evangelization, propagate our Catholic faith in a Christian way sowing seeds of love, peace, and unity throughout the world, wherever you send us. 
May the Filipinos whom you touched and enabled to live 500 years of faith continue to live an example of Christian life to honor you and serve you in our church and to glorify your name by the way we live our lives in our community and within our family. We ask this through the intercession of our Blessed Mother Mary and in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Hello everyone, my name is Julia. And my name is Matthew, and, and we, we are, are young, young members, members of Psalm 98, 98 Music Ministry. Today, we will share with you a beautiful song of gratitude. Give Thanks is a Christian worship song written by Henry Smith in 1976.
Thank you, Psalm 98, for sharing your talent through the songs. If this is your first time to watch this series of celebration here in Vancouver, don't worry, we will give you a quick recap of what happened. On April 16th, we launched the first of our four virtual events. This is our Archdiocese's celebration of the 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines. All over the world, the theme for 500 YOC is gifted to give. And for us here, we will talk about the giver, receiving the gift, treasuring the gift, and sharing the gift. There were many memorable experiences that we shared during our last event. The presentation of the 500 YOC logo, Joey Albert's rendition of the 500 YOC theme song, Gifted to Give, and Praise Team's production of the Filipino Faith and Culture. An exhortation about the giver was also given by Father Francis of the Order of St. Augustine. He reminded us of God the Father, the ultimate giver, giving us his only son, and for the Filipinos specifically, the explorers in 1500 who brought the good news to the Philippines. With your help, we were able to gather a net amount of $9,854.70 from 81 donors for Caritas Philippines. This time, we are still raising funds, but for two beneficiaries, Caritas Philippines and the construction of the Santo Nino, Child Jesus, Shrine in Agassiz, BC, which we will hear more about later on. The Santo Nino Shrine is a gift to the Archdiocese through the initiative of Filipino Catholics. How did the Filipino people receive the gift? How can we bring the gift wherever we go? How can this gift be relevant today and in the future? How can we revisit and rediscover the gift? These are just some of the questions we will hear from our speaker tonight. He was born and raised in Cebu, Philippines, and currently the parish priest of St. Anthony's Parish in Agassiz. Let us welcome Reverend Dennis Flores. Hi, everybody. We remember in the last exhortation that the giver is God and he is our father. And as a father, he gives us generously his greatest gift is himself through his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and came to our land first in the image of the infant Jesus. There are many reasons why the colonizers came to our land in 1521, some noble, others not so noble. In the process of receiving the gift of faith from the giver, many of our ancestors lost their lives, their properties, and in many ways their freedom. The suffering and sacrifices of those who, over centuries of colonial rule, endured horrific acts cannot be negated and simply dismissed. Why such price had to be paid, we may never really know and we may never really understand. We can, however, approximate the real purpose why God has allowed it by putting it within the context of Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, taking on our human nature, then subsequently suffering and dying in our hands for the sake of our salvation. In no uncertain terms, we can only condemn all acts of violence, oppression, and injustice inflicted by the perpetrators of the colonial rule, especially on innocent and simple people of the time. Having said that, we cannot but recognize that out of all the darkness of those historical events came forth the gift of faith, the gift of God of himself through Jesus Christ. And in his own divine wisdom, it all came to us through the Santo Nino, almost underscoring that our faith as a people will be just as simple, as naive, as basic, yet as true and faithful as that of a trusting child. On March 15, 21, the first Europeans arrived in Homonhon Leyte, headed by Ferdinand Magellan, a Portuguese who sailed for the King of Spain. They were in three ships, Concepcion, Trinidad, and Victoria. The first Catholic Mass was held in the shores of nearby Limasawa. 
Shortly thereafter, Magellan and his men sailed further west and landed in Cebu, then forged a friendship with Raha Humabon, who at that time had a feud with Datu Lapu-Lapu of neighboring Mactan. Magellan and Humabon agreed to invade Mactan, and in the ensuing battle, Magellan was killed by Lapu-Lapu. One of his ships managed to return to Spain through a westward route, thus marking for the first time the circumnavigation of the world. Spanish explorers arrived, more notably Rui Lopez Villalobos in 1543, who named the islands Islas de Filipinas in honor of King Felipe of Spain, and Miguel Lopez de Legazpi, who fortified Spanish foothold in the Philippines. Arriving on February 13, 1565, in Cebu, he made it his initial base and explored other parts of the country, including Bohol, where he made a blood compact with its ruler, Raja Sikatuna. The event, now commemorated as the Sandugo Festival in Bohol, is recognized as the first treaty of peace and friendship.
Legazpi intensified the subjugation of more areas, and Christianity spread like wildfire. Towns were established, and people in the villages were brought to the town for easy control and management. Wanting to expand the Spanish territory further, Legazpi sent Martin de Goiti to the north, and de Goiti engaged Raja Suleiman, who was then the ruler of the kingdom of Sulidang, the modern-day Manila, in battle. The Raja and his fighters, holed up in a fortress made of wood, were no match to the cannons and rifles of the invader. Sulidang was taken, and soon thereafter, Legazpi arrived from Cebu, made Manila as capital of the Spanish East Indies, and declared himself governor-general. As unique and special the way the gift came to us, so also is our response to it. We were colonized, yet we took it in stride. In fact, as a people, we still welcomed and even respected those who landed in our soil to oppress us, extending to them our natural expression of our culture and values, characterized by filial piety, humility, docility, gratitude, and joy. I don't think we will really have a true appreciation of the sacrifices, shame, insult, and even physical abuse some of our ancestors suffered in the hands of those who not only grabbed our lands, but more so enslaved, exploited, and marginalized our people. But here is the key to the way we received the gift. Our response exudes the same temperament and disposition of Mama Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 38. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. 
Now, while many materially successful people will consider Mary's total submission to God's will as a weakness, in reality, it is where the strength of our faith lies. Because like Mama Mary, we naturally recognize our standing in relation to God. He is our creator. We are his creatures. And just like Mary, we magnify the Lord and our spirit rejoices in God, our Savior. We are lowly and he has done marvelous things for us, all contained in his gift of himself to us. And no matter what happens to us, whether it be in experiencing natural disasters or man-made catastrophes, we simply yield and with trust and confidence say, Bahala nang Dios, God will take care of us. And often, we very, with very little desire to understand the meaning of what we are doing, we practice our faith as devotees, no sophistication, just simple obedience of faith to the extent that sometimes the devotions become even more important than life itself. How many prayer books do you have? Well, I have this whole big box of things like this cross and these prayer booklets. How about you? How many I, rosaries? I have so many. Like, I couldn't even count. Just have these blue ones, these pink ones. This one smells like rose, I think. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You know our Lola? She used to pray the Miraculous Meadow Novena on Mondays, the Novena to St. Anthony on Tuesdays, the Perpetual Help on Wednesdays, St. Jude on Thursdays, and then on Friday, she'd, she'd pray the Sacred Heart, um, and then 2,000 Hail Marys on Saturdays, and then she'd go to church on Sundays. She'd even help organize festivities like the Santo Nino Nazarino Santa Cruzan. Wow, talaga? That's mm -hmm. a lot. <laughs> We Catholics have a variety of ways of expressing our love to God, whether in private or with the whole congregation. We affirm our trust and commitment to Him through our prayers, devotions, and spiritual religious practices and traditions. Hi, my name is Michaela, And I'm Marlo. Sharing, sharing our, our love, love and, and devotions. Many of the devotions developed gradually over the years, and even centuries, as people sought many ways of living out their faith. Some of the origins of the more ancient devotions are not clearly known. There are devotions that were passed on to us as adaptations of the practices of religious orders. Other devotions came about in a private revelation from a vision or message given to one of the faithful or saints. By introducing the Catholic faith, the Church transforms the culture, leaving the imprint of the faith. At the same time, the Church assimilates certain aspects of the culture, and some elements of the culture become absorbed and integrated into the life of the Church. Some devotions cater more to specific ages, like the devotion to Don Bosco, who is the patron saint of the young and the poor. He emphasized devotion to the Blessed Sacrament, devotion to Mary Help of Christians, and devotion in support of the Holy Father. St. Lorenzo Ruiz and St. Pedro Calungsud are patron saints of Filipino youth and altar servers. For many centuries, the Church has turned to the Blessed Virgin in many forms of piety that help bring them closer to Christ. The Church honors her as the Mother of God and looks to her as a model of humility, obedience, and perfect discipleship. The Church asked for her prayers to God on our behalf. St. Clara of Assisi and St. Pascal Bellon form a triad that is the focus of the annual Obano Fertility Rites, held in the month of May. San Pascal Bailon's name was derived from the Spanish bailar, taken to mean one who likes dancing. He is also the patron saint of fertility, wealth, abundance, and for childless couples who wish to have sons. Santa Clara, the patroness of individuals seeking a mate and to have children, is also the patroness of good weather because of her Spanish name, Clara, referred to clearer skies. Devotees participating in the rites would sometimes hold eggs as they sway to the fandango, singing Santa Clara Pinong Pino. The original image of Our Lady of La Naval was brought to us by the Dominican friars from Alcapoco, Mexico in 1587. The image of La Naval and the Holy Child is the oldest Marian ivory sculpture in the country. 
The Santo Domingo Church is formerly known as the National Shrine of Our Lady of the Holy Rosary of La Naval de Manila. The invading forces of the Protestant Dutch Republic were repulsed during the battles of La Naval de Manila through the intercession of Our Lady of the Rosary. Pious believers also credit the Virgin through the icon with maintaining the Catholic faith in the Philippines, the nation in love with Mary. Since we have a variety of ethnic groups in our country, we must be sensitive to the fact that these groups often find that some devotional practice meets their spiritual needs better than others. It is not a one-size-fits-all. The image of Our Lady of Namakpakan, standing 6 feet 4 inches tall, is the tallest known Marian image in the Philippines and is known as the patroness of Ilocano travelers. Our Blessed Mother, locally known as Apo Bakit, manifested herself through miracles, apparitions, and wondrous graces she bestowed her devotees. St. Catherine of Alexandria Parish, a.k.a. Namakpakan Church in La Union, built in the 18th century by Augustinian friars, is a significant pilgrimage site for devotees. Our Lady of Manawag is a 17th century ivory and silver image of the Virgin Mary with the child Jesus enshrined at the high altar of the Basilica in Manawag, Pangasinan. The Basilica is a major pilgrimage site administered by the Order of Preachers. Miracles attributed to the Lady of Manawag include rainfalls during droughts, reviving an already dead boy by holy intercession and holy water, stopping a fire from the church and resisting various attempts at relocating the shrine. She is the patroness of the sick, helpless, and needy. Our culture of devotion to our Catholic faith is a full of standout cultural rituals, colorful feasts, and warm celebrations. The image of Black Madonna came to our country and was given to the Jesuits in 1626. Governor General Juan Nino de Tabora attributed his safe and successful voyages across the Pacific Ocean to the presence of the image, thus the title of Our Lady of Peace and Good Voyage. The Antipolo Cathedral is formerly known as the National Shrine of Our Lady of Peace and Good Voyage and the Immaculate Conception Parish. They believe that the patroness would grant all their wishes, especially when they had to go abroad, seek for greener pastures. The Redemptorists brought the icon of Our Lady of Perpetual Help to the Philippines in 1906. These two images helped nurture the image of the Redemptorists as missionaries of the poor. The people were inspired to spread the lessons from the mission and the devotion to Our Mother of Perpetual Help. The first Perpetual Help Novena in the Philippines was conducted by Father Patrick Nolte on May 13, 1946 at the St. Clement's Church in La Paz, Iloilo. From Iloilo to Lipa to Cebu, the Redemptorists finally started the Novia in Baclaran in June 1948. The National Shrine of Our Mother of Perpetual Help in Baclaran, Paranaque, Philippines is the biggest shrine in the world dedicated to Our Mother of Perpetual Help. Five to ten million devotees, visitors, and tourists visit the shrine throughout the year. Every Wednesday throughout the year, up to 150,000 devotees flock to the shrine. Although Wednesday is the climax of the week, the rest of the week also shows a perpetual influx of people in the shrine day and night. Flores de Mayo is one of the devotions to the Blessed Virgin Mary that lasts for the entire month of May. Children gather to have simple teachings about the life story of Mary, her apparitions, and Christian doctrines, values, and virtues. The children offer some flowers before the image of the Virgin Mary as a symbol of love, affection, and veneration. Holy Week is locally called Quaresma or Semana Santa. The week from Palm Sunday to Good Friday is packed with series of religious ceremonies. The Lenten practices and traditions are festive, colorful, dramatic, exciting, and so distinctively Filipino. The Pabasa is a Holy Week devotion which involves the uninterrupted chanting of the Pasion, an early 16th century epic poem narrating the life, passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
The chanting is non-stop for three to four days. On Good Friday, there is a reflection on the seven last words of Jesus and the staging of Cenaculo. In some places, this is the day of flagellate, and some even got nailed to the cross. The Salubong is a ritual meant to depict the apocryphal reunion of the Christ and His Mother, the Virgin Mary, after the Resurrection. Statues of both are born in two separate processions that converge at a designated area called Galilea, which is often an open space near the church. The high point is when the angels remove the veil from the Virgin's icon, signaling the end to a period of grieving and mourning. The veil may simply be pulled off the statue or tied to balloons or doves that are released into the dawn sky. The sorrowing virgin is ritually transformed into Nuestra Señora de Alegría. The angels throw flower petals at the icons of the Christ and the Virgin. The moment is punctuated by bells, pealing, brass bands playing, and fireworks. The congregation then gathers for Mass. Saints play different, sometimes overlapping roles in different cultures. They are intercessors, friends, protectors, healers, miracle workers, and role models. The love and veneration of the saints foster worship and love for our God. We pray that someday we can be in communion with them in heaven. Undas, todos los santos, in Spanish, all saints, and sometimes, araw ng mga patay, incorporates All Saints Day and All Souls Day. People visit their departed loved ones at the cemetery on November 1st to avoid the huge crowd. People will come to bring flowers or light candles, and most important of all, to pray for the dearly departed loves. Families spend a whole day or night at the cemetery and catch up with their other relatives. They bring lots of food to make the time more enjoyable for everyone. Then it becomes a festive reunion. The Black Nazarene, Poong Itin the Nazareno, is a life-sized image of a dark-skinned kneeling Jesus Christ carrying the cross enshrined in the minor basilica of the Black Nazarene in Quiapo, Manila. The Black Nazarene was carved in the 16th century in Mexico and then transported to the Philippines in 1606. The icon is considered by many Filipino Catholics to be miraculous. Its mere touch represented to cure disease. It attracts homage by numerous devotees and major processions every year. Two Nazarenos were kept in intramuros until January 9, 1787, when Archbishop Basilio Sancho ordered the Nazareno Nang Mahirap to be transferred to the Church of Quiapo. The Nazareno Nang Mayaman would be destroyed in the Battle of Manila. The church then made it an annual habit to bring out the replica and parade it on the streets to commemorate its transfer. The January 9 procession reenacts the image's translacion in 1787 or solemn transfer to the minor basilica from its original shrine instead of intramuros. The January 9 translacion is the largest procession drawing thousands of devotees thronging to touch the icon lasting 22 hours at the most. Throughout many generations, we follow long time recognized and accepted religious customs and traditions. It is our hope that God in his kindness and mercy will accept our sincere intentions and grant our petitions. Through the years, our love will grow. Like a river, it will flow. And it can't die because we're so devoted. To you. Over many centuries of the past, the native goodness of heart and fun-loving lifestyle of the Filipinos have attracted many more foreign intruders, while it meant having to adjust and accommodate never-ending changes, it taught people to be resilient, which, when combined with the basic faith and attitude of Bahala ng Dios, prepared for us to face the eventual post-Second World War development, fueled by modern technology and globalization. In addition, with every foreign intrusion came agents of the church, 
such as religious congregations that established missions which gave us hospitals, schools, and other institutions of well-being and learning. Naturally, the opening of national borders and availability of easier means of travel gave many of our countrymen the chance to look for better opportunities in other countries, such that today there are at least 20 million Filipinos in some 120 countries worldwide, not as colonizers, but as service providers, especially in the areas of health care, social services, and domestic matters. And you know what? Everywhere we go, we bring with us the practice and guidance of our faith. It is the same faith that gives strength to many Filipinos everywhere who, during the past 15 months, have served as first responders, healthcare practitioners, and essential workers in the fight against COVID-19 over the period it has been around. But beyond many examples of such heroic acts, we have also hand over and over again how nannies and domestic helpers bring families who employ them to faith through their loyal, selfless way of attending and caring for those they serve. It is in recognition of this reality and the hope of having a place where we can further witness to our faith that our parish community in St. Anthony of Padua in Agassiz, in cooperation with the Filipino Ministry Office of the Archdiocese, is now in the process of completing the pilgrimage shrine of Santo Nino. The plan is to enthrone the image of Senor Santo Nino, which came from Cebu, in our pilgrimage shrine. Our inspiration is the vision of seeing thousands and hundreds of thousands of Filipinos and non-Filipinos alike traveling each year to Agassiz to pray and celebrate with us. We know that with Santo Nino, there will be many miracles that will happen by way of healing, restoration of well-being, and life-changing conversions among those who would come and participate with us. In this respect, I appeal to your generosity in sending in your donations to help and build the facilities. The idea of enthroning the Santo Nino started when I had um, Novena uh, held here in St. Anthony Parish uh, in Agassiz. And so after that, uh, idea, an idea came to me, why not enthrone the Santo Nino, the shrine of Santo Nino here, the image of Santo Nino here in my parish to make it a permanent uh, uh, tradition in, in Canada. So I am here to make an appeal to each and every one of you um, uh, with your little or big <laughs> donation is already a big help to um, making this shrine a reality. So um, right now we are close to like $70,000 uh, but we still have a lot you know because uh, the, the project will totally cost at the estimate of $400,000. So, I am appealing to the generosity of all, especially all the Filipinos, um, to make this uh, project, this shrine dedicated to the something new. I am Antonio Ortega. I am the founder of the Cebuana Society in British Columbia, Canada. I believe that it is our faith and it is also a culture. So it's always be in the heart of the Cebuano that wherever you go around the world, the hearts of Santo Nino is, is always with us. So, so I'd like to encourage you to please support the Santo Nino Shrine in BC. Believe me, 
this will be a good project that really really represents for the Filipino community in Canada. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ching Kolobong. I have known about this St. Anthony. I go for it. That is the way I did. No explanations asked, but I think that is my direction to help more in the community that it's not in Vancouver, but regardless of what place I will be or it will be, that is where I go. I will spearhead the fundraising as well. I will do solicitations in as much as I will help, especially the people in Agassi. I will do the best I can. So this is not the end, it is only the beginning. So. Uh, I'm El Chora Bonita. I'm the president of the Philippine Vehicle Association of BC and at the same time the publisher of uh, Chronicle magazine here. I've heard about this project through Tony, my good friend Tony Ortega. I'm a, I'm a firm believer of Santini also. So I would like to uh, uh, support this project because I'm because of my faith, Santini. I'm a firm believer of Santini and uh, the, the child Jesus. And I, I, uh, I intend to support this project through uh, my personal capacities. I'm going to um, advertise and ask support from various groups and individuals here and in, around the world actually, so that it will help uh, for the realization of the Santini News right here. So God bless you all. Thank you. As we enthrone Senor Santo Nino in the shrine sooner than later, we entrust to him in a special way our youth. Being hardworking and service-oriented, most Filipinos who very early on ventured into the new global world of work, of commerce, of investments, and of social networks as overseas workers do well. And without fail, they send money back to the Philippines though often plagued with the complication of extended physical separation from their families and loved ones. This has taken its toll, especially on young children and young people. While the parents who are working abroad may continue to live their faith, the children left in the Philippines, sustained by a comfortable lifestyle, most often do not get the benefit of having their parents guiding them with the same faith that strengthened them to be materially gifted. Of course, there are those who are fortunate enough to bring their whole family to their newfound home abroad, such as Canada, while on the surface, their adjustment to the new environment may seem successful. On a deeper level, they usually face the difficulties of protecting the young ones from assimilating godlessness, individualism, and do whatever you feel like doing attitude, which is so common among citizens, both young and old, of more economically developed countries. Please don't go, get me wrong. I know there are also those who do well in the passing of the gift of faith to the next generation of Filipinos, even here in Canada. Invariably, these success stories seem to be about those who have attached themselves to Filipino Catholic associations. Through their complete process of initiation, formation, mentoring, and regular structured gatherings, these associations serve as beacons for us relative to our expression of faith. After all, where do you see Catholics attending Mass on Sundays and then staying on for another three or four hours more of praise and worship, you know, teachings and fellowship aside from the members of those associations. I understand from the Filipino Ministry Office that there is a plan to highlight the activities of these Filipino Catholic associations in the succeeding events planned for this year. The gift of faith we received is no different from love. While in our human relationships such as that which exists between a husband and a wife, we may be able to get by with very minimal expressions of self-giving, 
as happens when they are physically separated for extended periods of time, to do the same in our relationship with God is truly sad. God commands us to be faithful to his call because it is not we who called ourselves, but he who called us first. The husband, for example, who fails to be faithful to his wife is one who begins to believe that his love came from himself. It appears harmless, you know, this idea that love comes from us. And having been taught that it was a gift from God, we can easily fall into taking it simply as a routine of married life or priestly life. We then begin to take the gift for granted. We begin to appreciate it for its many perks and as a result, forget the giver. When the gift is separated from the giver, we stop thinking of it as a gift. We start thinking of it as the fruit of our own labors. Thus, from the mere recipient, we begin to act as owner. From being mere stewards, we start to behave like lords and masters. It is like receiving a gift and discarding it as nothing at the same instance. In fact, it is more than sad. It is foolish or crazy knowing that the gift is the gift of perfect love. We act like people who put on a strict diet only to hanker for a cup of ice cream as a reward for a month of good behavior like fasting. And we say, I have worked so hard to be a good husband or to be a good priest. Now it's time to loosen up a bit. The Lord will understand. This reminds me of an overseas worker who stayed faithful to his wife for many years. On his last contract overseas, he decided to indulge in what he had denied himself all those years. After all, he was now 60 years old. He was going to retire very soon. The Lord will understand, he told himself. But the Lord did not understand, it seems. With one single encounter of infidelity abroad, he contracted the HIV virus. And what is worse is that he did not know this until he came home and infected his wife. And while in anger, he might conclude God did not understand. In truth, he was the one who did not understand. Love, as lovers know, understands only one thing. Fidelity. Fidelity is loving without end, every day, every moment of the day. This is, after all, the way that God has loved us. He can demand fidelity from us because, as St. Paul tells us in the second letter to Timothy, if we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he will remain faithful, for he cannot deny himself. But how can we sustain love? How can we continue to be faithful when our hearts are frail by nature? That is precisely the problem. When we think it is by our own ability that we are able to love, then we also draw solely from our resources. When we think it is by our own effort that we serve, then we also lean on our own strength. Love cannot grow if it remains as love is centered on the self. Your married life, my priestly life, cannot be sustained by self-love. Self-love can only grow when we become more lovable, but a man who loves only himself can only become loathsome. A selfish person tends to love only himself, yet the more he loves himself, the more he aspires to become more lovable, which is why he seeks to increase his value by acquiring things and titles and praises and affirmations. The more he does this, however, the less lovable he becomes. That is the paradox of self-love. It seeks where there is nothing to find. It knocks where there is no door. The way to, un to sustain love is to allow ourselves to be drawn towards the source of love. And God draws us to himself. But, you know, we hold back of our fears. 
We fear we might lose ourselves. We fear we might lose our humanity. We fear we might lose our freedom. But all these, self, humanity, freedom, these are not separate things. They are one and the same, and they come from the same source, the God who is love. Our vocation can only be appreciated in all its beauty when we see it as a gift of love and a call to love. Love calls us into nothingness where we no longer remember our name but the name of the one who has called us first. As I was preparing this exhortation, it just dawned on me that the more I describe the gift God gives us, the more I realize how much more I do not know about the gift and what else I can do to receive it. Thank you for the opportunity to share my little knowledge and understanding of our giftedness with you. May this 500 years anniversary of our reception of the gift of Christian faith be a moment to forget and to remember, to forget the self we have always sought to please, and to remember only Him who is pleased with us, even though we are hardly pleasing to ourselves. May our hearts be sustained by a love that seeks not its own greatness, only that it be united with a love that is greater than our hearts. Amen. Thank you, Father Dennis, for that inspiring and spirit-led exhortation. You reminded us that our Christian faith was a silver lining throughout the tragic historical events that took place in the Philippines. This was God's gift given to us. And the best way to receive this gift is to imitate Mother Mary's total submission to God's will, recognizing our standing relation to God, Him the Creator and we are the creatures, him the lover, and we are the beloved. Everything we heard is a testament of how the gift is received and embraced. Father Dennis kept the faith fully alive in him, and now, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he is bringing the gift of Santo Nino here to the Archdiocese of Vancouver. I look forward to go on a pilgrimage there with our family once it is completed. Here in the Archdiocese of Vancouver, there are many Filipino Catholics who received the gift as well. This is manifested in their spirit of volunteerism as they serve their parishes in whatever way they can. They are few of the many people who are often in the background supporting the church in the various roles during the Mass, devoting their time to parish programming, and of course, enhancing the worship experience by bringing great music. Let us get to know some of them. All right. Hello again, everybody. Um, I am here uh, joined by uh, a, a young person who is very inspiring based on the short conversation I had with her prior to this interview. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome Alexis Villan. Alexis, hi. Hi. So let me throw the first question, if you don't mind. So what service are you involved in? What have, what have you done and are doing in the church currently? I think I've been serving at the church since firstly following in my brother's footsteps when he first he could start altar serving as a little boy. I remember thinking like, that's what I want to do. I want to follow what he's doing. Um, so the second I was able to start altar serving, I was. I probably altar served from like grade two up until I graduated high school. When I was about 15 years old, there was a youth coordinator at my parish who approached me and asked like if I felt comfortable joining the edge core team. So like the junior junior youth team. Um, and my brother was already part of the youth group already. So I was like, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Um, so I hopped on that boat and I decided and then I took a gap year after I graduated high school to do some mission work in Australia and I came back home. Um, and I was still a part of the, the youth group community. So I kind of slipped back into doing youth ministry work. The coordinator, she was married and then she felt pregnant. And she asked me, she was like, you just came off your year of net ministries. You're like high on the Holy Spirit. And I think that this would be a great opportunity for you just for one year. Um, and evidently she had her first kid 
um, was pregnant again and was like, I think I actually want to start my family now. So if you want to keep being the youth coordinator, the position is yours. Um, so that is currently what I'm doing now. I'm doing the youth ministry work at St. Mary's Parish mm -hmm. and I'm loving it. I'm loving it a lot. <laughs> I'm sure the parishioners love it as well. And and uh, quick question, because at, at your age, you've been serving for so many years now. Why do you serve? I just think of like the amount of service that I do. I also hear like, I believe it's the Bible verse that says like, lay your treasures in heaven. Um, and so a lot of what I try to do, like I don't want it to be merited for me. And that was something that I really struggled with as a teenager, like, um, but as I grow up, I realized that I just, I loved serving other people. I love the community and just seeing like the wisdom people could give me and the wisdom that other people receive were receiving from me. I think I just love serving because I just, I enjoy making other people happy and I enjoy um, just showing Christ within me mm -hmm. so that other people can see him. I also do like the live streaming when COVID first hit. Um, so Father Mark McGuckin, he had taught uh, one guy how to do the live stream. And then he was like, hey, Lexi, you should try doing the live stream too. So I also spend time doing the live stream. We all have our different schedules. Um, but to prepare for like for youth ministry work, it's a lot of grounding yourself in prayer. Um, and it's, I think just with a busy life and a busy schedule, it's hard to carve out time to pray. Um, so it's finding the little moments before running an event or before having meetings with the team, um, sitting everybody down and starting off in a prayer. For the live streaming part, uh, it's a lot of like, go, 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 set up the cameras, hook everything up, turn on the laptop. Um, but the few minutes before mass begins, it's either saying like a decade of a rosary um, or taking the rosary beads and just going through each bead saying, Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I trust you. You truly are very inspiring. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> and I'm not saying this because we're being recorded. I, I, I am inspired by you. We need more young people like you and uh, continue doing what you're doing. You are a light in this dark world. Thank you so much for doing this. We appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. We are now joined uh, by Michael Goko, who is a winner of the mass setting Misa ng Bayan ng Dios. Uh, welcome, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here. So let me throw the first question at you. And uh, this is uh, so which can you tell us which parish you belong to? And how long have you been serving in your parish? Right. Uh, I go to St. Monica in Richmond. It's, uh, currently, um, I currently have a Jesuit pastor, Father Robert Wong. Uh, I've been in that parish for a decade or so now. Yeah. Absolutely. I, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I know Father Wong. So what type of service do you do in, uh, in the parish? Mm -hmm. uh, I joined the choir first. To, to sing with 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 a group, um, but also it was kind of required for some school requirements to have some volunteer experience. But eventually, uh, I became choir director, and uh, I've been serving in that role for yeah the last eight or nine years now. Very refreshing. There's always something new every year. And I love it. I really like it. So as I mentioned in my short introduction, you are the winner. Congratulations of the mass setting. Misa ng Bayan ng Dios contest. So what inspired you to write your song? I I am firstly very grateful for the Filipino ministry for having celebrations for the 500 years of Christianity. It's certainly a milestone that uh, deserves to be recognized. Um, the Filipino people have been a gift to the world. And not, I'm not saying that in the sense that I am, I am a gift to, to the world, more so that the Filipino people's faith and culture have... Um, have nourished my own my own sense of self and my own sense of faith while I was growing up. So when I saw the uh, the contest, I thought, well, I'd contribute to to whatever I can. And um, music is uh, something that I've been intimated with ever since growing up. I, I love singing in choirs. I've written an English mass setting back in 2011, uh, which also got approved by the Archdiocese of Vancouver. That wasn't for a contest or anything. So I well, I thought I. I'd write the Filipino one uh, for for this particular contest. I'm still quite competent in my Filipino, so I thought it 
it would be a little bit of a challenge, but uh, it's, it was something I thought I could do and submitted it. One, I guess. Congratulations again, and thank you for doing this. We need more Filipino composers like you. Uh, that's very connected with who they are. Amen, amen to you, and amen to that. So, Michael, to to whom would you ascribe the way you received your faith so strongly? I would say that I did grow up in a, in a Catholic home. I I would be amiss not to uh, mention my grandmothers, uh, who have been very diligent in being patient with me, sitting beside them, reading Bible stories, uh, and teaching me how to pray. Um, growing up in a, a Catholic school and in some way a Jesuit uh, spirituality sense of seeing God in all things and finding God in all things. Uh, yeah, I would, I would describe my, my faith to that. Um, also my parishes in the Philippines, especially the one that where I was baptized in, named after the Sacred Heart of Jesus, uh, that too um, has been a source of good consolation for me, the, the big traditions that we've had. Absolutely. I mean, we all grew up witnessing that and being part of that. And as you've mentioned, it takes a village, you know, from from your grandparents to the parish and uh, to, to shape who you are right now. Thanks to Lolo and Lola, right? It starts from there. Of course. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. Keep on doing what you're doing. And uh, thank you for inspiring me. And I know that uh, all our viewers are inspired by your sharing. Thank you very much. I hope so too. Thank you very much. And thanks for this opportunity. God bless. Uh, at this moment, we are joined by uh, the winner of the 500 Years of Christianity theme song, uh, Gifted to, to Give. Good evening, Sister Vicky. Hello. Good evening, everybody. I'll ask the first question. Uh, yep. So, uh, Vicky, which parish do you belong to and how long have you been serving in your parish? So, I belong to Our Lady of Sorrows here in Vancouver. And I have been doing the music ministry since 2005. I play the piano at the 5 p.m. mass on Saturdays. And I'm joined by wonderful singers um, in all, all ages, youth to young adults to moms. It's a family affair, so we're blessed to have. Again, congratulations for being declared the winner of the 500 Years of Christianity theme Thank song you. competition. Um, what inspired you to write your song? Um, at that time, it was 2020, the so last year, so as I had a lot of time uh, on my hands, and um, I have created and, and created music before, but only for family occasions, so nothing like this at all, so this is my first entry to any competition. Um, I'm not musically trained by any means, so it's just really for pure love of music. Um, and then I found out about it and I thought I'd give it a try. So the melody started in my head first before the lyrics. And then I read up a little bit more um, about uh, what is uh, the, the 500 years of Christianity. And then I could, at least I could put some words together that will be meaningful with the, the song. And of course, I, I want to give tribute to my mom because she is my inspiration. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, uh, our moms are the best, right? So. Mm. Thanks for that for that story. So um, what would you say to the rest of our fellow Filipinos who are watching us tonight uh, in the Archdiocese with respect to growing in faith uh, that you received 500 years ago from, from Spanish? Um, I think we are all um, in the same page when I say that we are very blessed that we have the love of um, God in our culture, love of family, and love of music. I think those are just three traits that are very universal among Filipinos. I, I'd like to say that because of our faith, um, God has given us a lot of gifts. Sometimes we don't even know what they are, but we all have gifts that little or big or tangible or intangibles. I think we all have gifts that we can share to others. And the faith actually is what pushes us forward to help our, our fellow men. The little amount of um, um, time that we give or little amount of giving that we give goes a long way for a lot of people. Amen. Amen to that. And uh, mm -hmm. you are a great example. And uh, the little conversation that we had prior to this interview, um, thank you very much for sh sharing your gifts. There are no small thank gifts, you. as you've no. mentioned, and uh, the world needs people uh really people like you 
the world need people uh, that are willing to share their gifts to the world, uh, no matter how small or big they are. Thank you very much, Sister Vicky. Thank Have a you. great evening. We'll talk to you Thanks. soon. Thank you. Praise God. I'm affirmed that it is Jesus that we received, and he is also the best gift we can give to others, especially our family. The pandemic posed a real challenge to keep our faith alive. When COVID shut down in-person masses, we felt a strong call to continue sharing the Sunday gospel with our kids. Since they are still young, it's hard for them to sit still for a very long time. We tried incorporating Sunday service as part of our routine, a prayer service that includes many parts of mass, hymns, penitential rite, readings, prayers of the faithful, and spiritual communion. We found this to be an engaging way to grow in our faith without any use of screens. Recently, we were blessed with the opportunity to be part of the live stream team in our parish and attend mass inside the church every so often. God continues to find ways to make his presence felt in our family. Let us remember that the Holy Spirit is in us since our baptism, and it is Jesus that we receive every time we receive the Eucharist. Just like Pentecost, it is not only the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and disciples, but also the fruits and effects of that event, the completion of the work of redemption, the fullness of grace for the church and its children, and the gift of faith for all nations. May we find our purpose and participate in the plan of the Lord in winning the world for him as we listen again to the theme song. Here we are now gathered as God's family Celebrating faith in history Centuries since we've embraced God's mysteries Over generations we pray faithfully With God's grace and blessings we receive We have been gifted to give Thank you everyone for coming. Before you go, we have some announcements. First, the next event will be on September 17th, same time at 6 p.m. Don't forget to donate 
you can visit www.filipinoministry.ca. Third, you can follow or join our Facebook page for more updates. Just search Filipino Catholic Ministry. Fourth, if you want to help out and volunteer for the succeeding events, feel free to email us. And lastly, we would like to thank all the volunteers, to those who are behind and in front of the camera, to our sponsors, to the supportive parishes, and of course, the Archdiocese of Vancouver. May God bless us all.